Let's kick it. <laughs> Hello and welcome to what's new in Whistler Build 2410 Part 2. Now if you haven't seen Part 1, I would suggest you watch it by clicking on the bottom icon here. Or alternatively, you can subscribe if you're into that sort of stuff. Or you can just continue on and watch this Part 2 and all the goodies it contains. Here we go. 2410 isn't all good though. It's introduced a bug into the application compatibility shims thing if you now run compat now we have a few more to pick from instead of just nt4 sp5 and win9x full we've now got windows 2000 and this profile setup whatever that means but anyway the problem is now this doesn't actually work at all you can open up a program for instance cmd For instance, CMD, and notice we've got the Win9X full selected, and you'll notice the version hasn't changed. It says 5.1.2410. Now I did that before, and I couldn't remember which one was the working one and the not working one, so I tried them both, and you can see it still hasn't changed. So neither of those work. That one doesn't work. And that one doesn't work. So just from testing ver, you can tell that at least the version thing doesn't change. And also these log files don't get created anymore. So I don't know quite what happened to run compat between 2296 and 2410, but it got broken. There's also been several changes to the help content in this version mainly in the made not to work sense. Now if we go into when I find out where it is, it's music and video games and photo photos. Then if you pick games and I think it's that one. Nope, maybe that one. Yep. Now if you click what is direct X and you get this page not found with its temporary text. So yeah that doesn't exist and some of these topics don't exist actually most of these topics don't exist okay most of these topics do exist it's just that one that doesn't exist and this is most obvious and evident when you get to I think it's discovering windows and if you want to look at the license agreement nope that's not found either so you can't look at that another thing that doesn't work in help anymore is advanced search options that also it doesn't work because the panel has been removed but some things which haven't been removed but which have been included but not well included in the files but not included in the actual help center is a gif and some other things which I'll show you when we get there they're in images Now you notice there's this GIF here called the push one dot gift gift gif. And what it seems to be is some sort of mock-up for what they eventually wanted it to look like. Because instead of just having see if we can get this up. Come on. Doesn't want to work. There we go. Now as you can see here we've just got the support updates, compatibility and tools in the support services section. Hmm, taskbar's not working. But anyway, you can see in this one, they're all called Center. And as it's called the uh, Help and Support, well, Center in the final version of XP is called Help and Support Center, I think, isn't it? But anyway, yeah, these are all called Centers. So we've got the Update Center, Interactive Support Center, Compatibility Center, and Tools and Information Center. So it's quite obviously essential to their plans. Yeah, there's also something down here. You can see that they were calling it still Windows 2001. So this is quite an old GIF. And there's also a reference down here to Windows 2000 Personal Edition. 
and that's what's interesting about that, it doesn't show up as far as I can tell in the actual help and support center services thing. So it's just hanging around in the images folder. Yeah, testpad's not working. Also in here there's a new folder and it's called TSDiag and what this is this is new first build. That picture was in that GIF picture was in 2296, but this is new in this build, and it's the Windows 2000 Terminal Services Diagnostics tool, or Diagnosis tool. And you'll notice if you scroll down a bit in this bit, it says all information on the Microsoft internal web is Microsoft confidential. So obviously this wasn't meant to be seen by anybody, or it's a previous version from the Microsoft intranet. Either way, yep, it diagnoses connection problems with your computer, well, with this build. And yeah, it's just for troubleshooting terminal services. I'm not going to go through it all because it just runs a few tests. Like if you click on that one and you click diagnose, it just goes through and looks for some things. And it says remote connections allowed, failed, because that's not enabled on this build by default, the remote connections. So that is that. There's also, I think, something else. Oh, that might be it. Oh, yeah, the update center of from that GIF is actually partially implemented. If you click on it from here, you get the old text about it not being available. But if you actually go to the Start menu and run HCP colon slash slash system slash update center slash update center dot htm you get this which is a picture this is windows update and a testing connection you also sometimes get some text down here about it not working and how you can diagnose your connection to make it work there you go you get this and it says you know you need to connect to the internet so it's like a precursor to the final uh, windows update Tool. I think there was a, a standalone tool one that was on the start menu in XP. It's been too long since I used XP, I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, this does actually work if you're connected to the internet, which I will be in a minute to show you what it does. Right, I've connected to the internet, so let's see what happens when you are connected. And what happens is it all goes white. And then you get a picture of Microsoft support website and it says it can't load a certain website address. Now I checked this KB article, it's just the one saying that you know you can't use Windows Update on a XP computer anymore. So there's nothing special about that. It's obviously being redirected from somewhere. But due to the magic of Wireshark, we can actually see what it has been doing. Now first thing is what it does to see if it's connected, it just checks Microsoft.com with a head request to see if it exists and it gets an OK from that so it is connected so then after that it then checks for a iZapper slash reader DLL and that doesn't exist anymore on Microsoft's server so it fails that so then it asks for something else and that's the same Reader DLL with some extra bits attached, so it says product equals Whistler. AR, I don't quite know what that means, but that's HSS's Help and Support Center, well, Help and Support Services, and SBA, whatever that is, an update center, and the LCID, which is the language code. And then um, the Microsoft server responds, yep, we got that. Well, it's moved to windowsupdate.com slash blah 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 blah. So then somewhere over it will actually request that. That's not there. It's not in that request. But anyway, it does request that and then eventually it gets to it's not that one, is it? Yeah, it is that one. And then that re redirects it to version six of the Windows update. And that's the thing that actually redirects it to the knowledge base article because that doesn't exist anymore for XP computers, you can't do, use that. And that's why it fails. So the update center is partially working. Within the help center's files, there's some 
new folders which contain some new stuff apart from the TSDiag. There's also this error message folder and the errors folder. Now the error message one is called error messages offline, so if you just click it you'll you know you'll get what you expect, which is something which is new, because this wasn't there before, it's about looking up error and event log messages and you think oh it doesn't quite work because it says internet connection required but we actually do have an internet connection but if you actually run it from the help center like we did before by just sticking hcp colon slash slash like in front of the file path then it does actually work it connects and then it looks for a page on windows.com microsoft.com whatever it is and it doesn't work because it's not there anymore Unfortunately, if we look at archive.com to try and see what that page eventually looked like, it doesn't quite exist. Now, one does exist if you chop off this bit on, on the end. And unfortunately, there's only one solitary reference to it. And unfortunately, that is also just the frames document, it's not the actual content bits. So, all that is saved is these blue lines that go up and, the, up and down and across, which delineate the frames. But yeah, that's all that exists of that. The errors folder, on the other hand, are just the normal errors you see within the help center, like this redirect one, not that one, like the not found one here, which has the temporary text thing we've seen before, so there's nothing really exciting about that folder. 2410 also contains a rather unexpected easter egg, though this time it's not in WordPad or the printer dialogues, because I've done that trick once before. No, this time it's actually in the defrag. MMC console. So when you open that and you get the disk, disk, disk defragmenter, then if you go to help and about the bottom one, then this happens. I suppose you heard those three dings then, and that happens every time you go to help. So it's also a rather weird Easter egg, I don't know why that's happening that's been put in, it doesn't happen in 2296, so who knows where it came from. There is a difference though in this about dialog, since it now lists Microsoft name in the credits as long with Executive Software International. That's new, so obviously while somebody put in their Microsoft copyright they actually put those things in, and this also says Whistler now instead of just Windows 2000. I also just wanted to clear up one sort of I don't know, it's not really an oddity, but in Neptune, most of the references to to it was just Microsoft Neptune and the windows had been dropped from most places. Well, I just wanted to show you that that's not just for Neptune, it happens with other things as well. And if I can click the right thing, I can show you. So that one. If you go down to the new group policies for Whistler, then on the left here, it just says Microsoft Whistler. It doesn't say Windows Whistler, it's just... Microsoft Whistler and they've dropped the windows completely. So dropping the windows is something that they seem to do internally. Our old favourite, the hidden UI, comes back with a vengeance in this build. If you find a JPEG or any sort of image and send it to the an mail recipient, then you get this as we saw before about optimizing the file and you can click on optimize and oops. I didn't want that button. I wanted the middle one, not that one. Yeah, and you can see it's just a, a standard image and you don't get to save it afterwards and you optimize and it attaches it to the email and there you go. But what you can do though is if you go to send to, then before clicking on mail recipient, if you press shift and then while you're clicking on this adjust the level of optimization, you, you still hold shift, then you get a save button on the bottom left and then what that allows you to do is save a copy of the compressed file folder folder file image file after it's been resized and got compressed so if you do that after that you then get a you then get a choice to execute the image now this doesn't mean put it in front of a firing squad it just means open it to show it in the standard image viewer so you can see what it looks like before you go sending it off so yeah it's just a nice 
bit of hidden UI that's actually useful for once. We've covered a lot of things about Explorer so far, but there's one thing that still needs to be uncovered. If you look into the resources of Explorer in this build, then you'll notice that among the new things is a UI file. Now UI files are the sort of layouts for direct user and it's what the logon screen uses to lay out all its various things. So what could this be for? Because it's not used so far, we haven't seen it. Now if you just look at the HTML, because it's sort of HTML, then you just get a bunch of buttons in a row because, well, it doesn't work properly. And if you expand it, you can see there's a load of spaces to start with for some reason. And then there's something that looks a bit like HTML, it's sort of not really. But when we get to the content, after all the style, well I guess it's a style sheet of sorts, then you get to these elements and it tells you what's in it. Now there's a white foreground, a background of whatever colour that would be, 107, 117, 165, I don't know. And then there's these bitmaps. It says right background is 101. So if we look at number 101 in the bitmaps, which is also new, then it's a little tg dot, so it'd probably be repeated and it'd be entirely that colour. Also, there's some content, there's a couple of pictures at the top, as you can see here, three pictures, and they are other bitmaps. So it's 103, 104, and 105, yep. And we recognise that picture, that's one of the backgrounds. That's also one of the desktop backgrounds. And there's also another one of the desktop backgrounds. So they'd be at the top. Also, a bit further down, you may notice there's something called the user picture and the welcome tile, which has some st a string with number 200 in it. So if we look at string 200, which is in this one, then you can see it says welcome. And if you look down this list, then it may start to become familiar what this actually is. If not, if we look at the next one, this sort of gives it away, the next bit of it, this bitmap 106, 107 and 108. So if we look at those, then that one, that one, and that one. Have you guessed it yet? Yep, they re-implemented this. It's the start. Um, background, active desktop start page background thing that was in 2250 that didn't actually ever look like this because some of the components were missing. And yeah, they decided to re-implement this in direct user. And in case there was any doubt, even though it's quite conclusive, the lady from the picture is still there. So yeah, I actually I tried to get this working, but it doesn't work. If you try enabling it, then it crashes, as I will show you now. First though, I just want to show you how you actually enable it. And it's a rather weird method. Instead of actually just having a registry, registry key saying start page or something like that, there's a registry key in software, Microsoft, Windows, current version explorer. I know that goes off the page there, but this one here, current version explorer, and it's actually a value called fault ID. Now that's always there, but it has to have a certain value. If you just look down here, it's this one here, it's 65 in hex, which is 101. So what you then have to do is go to budget it, obviously, and then find fault ID. Set that to 101, and then you have to restart Explorer. Then I advise you keep RegEdit open if you try this. Keep RegEdit open because when you restart Explorer, something weird and wonderful happens. It crashes. Yep, that's why you should keep it open, because you have to turn it off, otherwise you're in a crash loop, crash loop and it's impossible to get out of. 
so fix it so that's as far as that goes this full ID key has another weird thing with it though if you set it to a non-zero value it's obviously not 101 then when Explorer restarts there we go eventually it works then when Explorer restarts with that going well with that set to a non-zero value you get a test bar at the bottom but no icons now what you can do is if you double click on the background anywhere then the start menu pops up so I don't know if that's just in case the icons fail to load or something as a sort of fallback way to get to things because the start button still works but yeah if you set it to non zero value the icons don't load and that pops up so with the actual start page I thought well since Explorer can't load it properly and as I said the logon screen the logon UI logon screen actually does use direct UI I thought I'd replace it and see if that can load them if I put it into logon UI see if it could load them well it came with some sort of mixed results if I find it where did I put it I don't know it's also it's quite a hindrance when you're trying to do something I think it's this one and when it starts nah it doesn't work I knew that beforehand, it also doesn't work, but it, it's also, this is also Windows Explorer, I don't know why, I think it's because I've replaced one of the resources and that must say Windows Explorer in the resources, but there we go. It's, oh, stop, come on mouse. So it's actually log on your eye that's died there. So yeah, it doesn't work and it there's nothing I can do about it to make it work because there's some initialization code within Explorer that's not there or sets things to a wrong value and that's why it crashes. There's one other oddity with Explorer's resources in 2410 and it's this one. It's called IDB Start BKG so I guess that'd be Start Background and it's among the new resources so it's been added in and what it is is that I'm not quite sure why it's been put back in. I mean, the start menu still has the code name Whistler one. So I'm not really sure why that's been put back in, but put back in it has. One other app also had its resources meddled with, and not in a small way either. If you go to Hyperterminal and start it, then you might think nothing out of the ordinary, it started and everything. And then if you go to help and about, then you might think, okay, everything looks okay and fine. But then if you go to 2296 and open hyperterminal there, then you'll notice a bit of a difference. There's a splash screen. And then it starts, and then if you go to help, well about, then you get sort of a nice animation for it and if you click on this then you get a message about upgrading to a product that the company will wrote this because it's not Microsoft code it's Hillgrave Hillgrave it's Hillgrave's code so Microsoft well they developed it for Microsoft by Hillgrave as it says there and yeah you get that and you can click that and yeah so it's had its resources diddled with even though they got rid of that animation the base file at least exists in the resources and they've gotten rid of the developed for Microsoft by Hillgrave bit at the bottom and over on the right as well. I think the bit up here is a bit of an animation that they do themselves but the text on the bottom I'd expect to stay the same and it's not there so that's been deleted by somebody. If you're a long time viewer you're probably thinking yeah, that's all nice and good and that, but what about Narrator? Well, it has indeed been changed slightly a bit in this. If you remember in some of the previous versions, it's had its sensory software's URLs being broken and then fixed. And now it's been removed completely from the bottom. So no chances of it getting it broken now because it's not there to be broken. The only URL now points to Microsoft website and that's been there forever. 
and it's now at version 1.5 instead of 1.0 but I can't really see any functionality changes so it's probably just internal stuff and bugs they fixed to pump it up to 1.5. If nothing else, 2410 has been the build in which Microsoft has sought to get rid of the logos of all their partners. We've seen them get rid of Hill Greaves thing in Hyperterminal, we've seen them get rid of Sensory Software's URL in Narrator, and they didn't stop there. If we go to the on-screen keyboard, then the about, then it just says version 2 Microsoft Corporation. Nothing else, as if they have wrote everything to do with this completely. But if we go down to 2296, its version of the on-screen keyboard, then we can see it was actually built by somebody called Medenta. And they've got rid of the logo, they've got rid of their copyright. See, they've got rid of pretty much everything. They've upgraded it from version 1, so maybe that's why, but I mean, I think it wasn't, um, Hyper Terminal wasn't upgraded, so I don't know why that got, got rid of it there, so maybe it's just a general thing they were doing. As you can see, this was also some sort of trial version. So maybe that's why they bought out the licenses or something, so they didn't have to put up with that in their products. I don't know. But either way, they got rid of any mention of Medenta. So there's no mention of them ever being involved in this now. Delineation of professional and personal versions continues apace, and now it's in more in your face areas rather than just underneath the covers and the most in your face area you can pretty much find it nowadays is in the help of the user accounts control panel option most notably in the user account types in the personal versions there's only two options here the administrator and limited user there's none, no middle ground of standard users in this one even though as you can see here if you've already had a professional one and downgraded it to personal then you still actually have a standard account. As you can see there's now three options in the change if you already have standard accounts but if you only have if you have an administrator or a standard user the only thing you can change them to I mean ad administrator or limited user the only thing you can change them to is administrator or limited. There's no standard there that only exists for existing accounts and some of the helpers change as well. Most of them now start with these questions for some unknown reason because if you've clicked on deleting your account you probably want to know about deleting your account so that seems superfluous. Also all the help now has this line on the bottom about seeing help and support for more information and that's just text at the minute it doesn't actually do anything you can't click on it So yeah, and as if by magic to show you the difference. Poof, here we are in the professional version. And uh, just to show it in the corner. Thanks for covering it up there, balloon. But anyway, yep, you can see it's not on this one, is it? It's the user account types one. Yep, you can see on this one there's three of them. And in the resources, there's actually one for each. It doesn't actually just chop out the middle bit or conditionally show it or anything with divs and that, nope, it's just there are different pages for different, well for both configurations like as you can see here, the ones without the two at the end are the professional version ones and it says there are three types of user accounts and if you stick it onto the second one then you get text that says there are two types of user accounts so yep, that's another difference that we've now got to add to the collection of professional and personal. Another thing that got a small lick of paint in 2410 is the remote desktop connection app. The bitmap is no longer a temporary one and it's this nice new connection. I think it goes well especially with this theme because it's got the like the dark, well, faded orange and light green which goes well especially with this theme, maybe not with the watercolour one, but with this one definitely. And I think it's reminiscent of the 2250 icons when they grouped, first grouped the things on the control panel and they had all them weird washed out icons. I think it'd go well with that, so it's a bit behind the times in that regard. Although it's 
miles better than the picture they did have previously, which was that one. Obviously, there's that one. Even the low colour one looks a bit better. I mean, it's not brilliant. You can obviously tell it's got the limitations, but it looks quite nice still, I think. It still go well. Going back to Explorer Bars for a minute, I found that as well as just enabling them and letting you turn them on via the menus and the things on the side, there's actually an API built into this version of Internet Explorer which lets you add them on programmatically from like a web page and that. And this is actually an API that doesn't exist in XP. So it existed for pretty much this build and the next build and that's as far as I've looked. But obviously it got removed and actually it's in the type library, it's in this interface called iShell UI Helper. And that helps because that means you can actually call it from JavaScript and don't need to do any C++ or anything because these methods are the ones you can call with window.external in JavaScript. And that's precisely what I've done here. So if I just open it, then ignore the caption, it doesn't show the language dialog. What it does, I just set up a button here to call the add bar, that's what they call the new API. And it takes a bunch of parameters, including the name of it, the website, uh, an icon, another icon, two things relating to the size, and something called om access, which I don't know what that means. But it takes full and none, so I just went for full. And anyway, what you can do is call that in JavaScript, and then you get this dialog. And it says the web page you are viewing is attempted to install an explorer bar on your computer. Do you want to let them do it? And if you don't, you click no. And then it says it's not added. And if you do, then it gets added to the left here. It doesn't actually look up the icon, so I don't know if that's just not working or if it just something wrong with this computer's internet connection. Because well, this VM's internet connection. Because if I click on it to show Microsoft.com, it doesn't work because it says action cancelled and then if you refresh then it says it can't display the page and if you keep doing that then it just keeps saying no. You can see at the bottom there that it's trying to actually access Microsoft.com so not really sure why and you can just remove it the normal way but anyway that's not the import, that's not the thing that's not working because that obviously does all work the thing that's not working is if you go to this more info button here it says you choose this website and you went mm, I don't know let's give yourself give me some more info and then you get boo Ooh, we need a help file for this. So yeah, that's not that's basically what I wanted to show you. It's something that they haven't quite finished off yet, which is to be expected, but you know. Not to be expected is the boo caption. I don't know if I thought that was funny and worth showing off. There's another thing funny in Internet Explorer's resources, but actually Shadok views resources. That I'm not really sure it's pretty, it's pretty much how I found that in the first place, but it's a bitmap and it's this bitmap now this is the sign for pretty much like hazardous materials and stuff like that biohazards and stuff like that and at first I thought it would pop up on this dialog, I thought that's where it would be used because it's sort of a, a bigger space than normal for this icon so I thought they might shrink it down and put it there but it doesn't actually go there so I don't really know, it's not referenced in the code that I can see so I'm not sure what it's about. Yeah, it just struck me as something kind of weird. I mean, don't know why that's there. It's not referenced. I looked in the next version, and it's not referenced there either. So strange. Just one other curiosity you might have noticed by yourself, or you know, just looking around at this video, that most of these icons now in Explorer and Internet Explorer have little question marks overlaid on the bottom corner of them, the bottom right corner. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's meant, you know, if they just mean that they're going to update them. Or they're not sure if they're going to update them. So I've just got question marks next to them. As you can see, it's not just on those, it's on that one as well. The mail icon and the print icon. The contacts and messenger ones, okay. It's just all the rest, pretty much, the original icons. And that's going to just about do it for Whistler 2410. If you're still watching, thanks for watching. And I'll see you in 24. Whoa, 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 we're not done yet. I managed to solve the mystery of the internet photo printing web publishing wizard entry thing. 
and what you have to do is move a picture into my pictures I did this as part of something else and then I noticed that on the left here it says order prints via the internet and lo and behold yep that's the internet print ordering wizard and instead of the normal three entries it just has this one for the photo printing site like I said though it doesn't work because it can it tries to connect to a Microsoft address that isn't accessible from the outside or just plain doesn't exist anymore so that's the mystery of the internet photo printing wizard solved.